other day. All right, let's go get our Bibles ready. Let's open up to 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter number 1 as we continue our study in the book of 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter number 1. Let's go ahead and read verses 13 and 14, which is going to be our text today. It says, Hold fast the form of sound words, which thou hast heard of me, in faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. That good thing, which was committed unto thee, keep by the Holy Ghost, which dwelleth in us. Today we're going to stop and we're going to look at verses 13 and 14. But let's put a quick reminder of where we're at. The Apostle Paul's in prison. He can't get out. All he has is his death sentence. And all he's doing is trying to communicate to Timothy what he needs to do so that he does not become a, a, a fatality of the culture. A fatality of religi religiosity. He wants Timothy to follow the pattern and the structure that the Apostle Paul has left for him. He doesn't want him to be ashamed of the Lord Jesus Christ. He doesn't want him to be ashamed of his testimony or Paul's testimony. He wants him to live for the Lord. <coughs> Excuse me. We've already covered six, if you, if you were here for the time. We've already covered six imperatives. Imperatives are commands. And the Apostle Paul is going to use 19 commands in 2 Timothy because he wants Timothy to know, I'm out of here. I'm not going to be around. Tomorrow I could actually die. The execution could come knocking on my door and pull me out. I don't know when I'm going to go. He said, I fought my fight. No, I'm going to finish my course. I have done what I needed to do. Now it's your turn. Stop being timid. Stop being ashamed. Start serving. Start utilizing the gift God has given to you. And he uses six imperatives. Well, here we come to the seventh imperative to help us not to be ashamed in our culture. Because pretty much that's what those six imperatives did. Was a reminder for us to say, look, the culture we live in is not as bad as it was when Timothy was in his culture. It's getting close. But it wasn't the same. In Timothy's culture, when Domitian and all those other fellows were in charge over there, what they did was, if you were a Christian, you could be killed. We don't have that right now. Now, if you're in Nigeria, you might have that. And maybe in some other areas you might have it. But right now in the United States, you can still be a Christian and not be killed. Right, But in, in, uh, over there in Rome, you were blamed for the burning down of Rome. You were blamed for everything. And Paul's in prison right now just because he preached the gospel. We don't have that. The political realm was terrible. They hated Christians. They thought they were mad people. They thought they were insane. They thought they were trying to overturn everything. And so you, the culture back then was pretty bad. You couldn't do anything. You'd lose your job, your house, perhaps even your life. Well, then you go to um, the social aspect. It wasn't good. To, it wasn't socially acceptable to be a Christian, right? You were made fun of all the time if you were a Christian. The gospel was not readily acceptable. You you were you were ostracized from every area of life. Talk about a cancer culture. The the society did not like Christians. They saw them as nothing but problems. They were taking away finances from people. They were taking away profit margins. They were taking away businesses. They were doing all kinds of stuff. And so socially, they hated Christians. Matter of fact, that's where the name Christian came from, right? It was people that were actually antagonizing people that lived for the Lord. Christian today is just a moniker that we throw on if you have anything that talks about Christ. But back then, they called them, you guys are Christians. It was derogatory. It meant you're acting like Jesus Christ. That's, what you were, that's how you got the title. You just couldn't claim the title that you were a Christian like people do today. Anybody could call themselves Christians and they think, it's, oh, it's kind of cool. Well, it's getting less and less cool now. But more and more, it's just, hey, I can just call myself a Christian. I'll wear a little cross. I'll do a couple things and, you know, I'm good. And that's not what it meant to be a Christian. A Christian meant being sold out for the Lord. And people, your, your enemies would say, you're a Christian, right? It was pretty antagonistic where Timothy was. And according to 2 Timothy, it seems like he was starting to get a little timid. He was starting to become a little cowardly. He was starting to back off a little bit. And so Paul says, no. Get out there and do it. And now we come to verse 13 for the seventh one. And the title of this one's going to be, Don't Waver from the Truth. You are going to be tempted in our culture to waver from the truth, to dumb down Bible words. We are going to be tempted to do that in our culture and in our political realm so that we can become more acceptable. But there's a problem that happens when we do that. And we're going to look at that today. So verse 13, Paul tells Timothy, hold fast. That word hold there means to grip onto. It means to have within your possession, to retain it. Don't let it go. 
Timothy, this is something that you already have. This is something you should already be doing. So continue to grip onto it so that way it doesn't slip away from you. Because once you start loosening that grip, the further that thing can pull away from you. And once it pulls away, it can get out of control. Right? And so that's what he's saying here. He's saying hold fast. That literally means to hold on with a tight grip. What is he supposed to hold fast to? Hold fast the form of sound words. What does the word form mean? Well, the word form means a model, a prototype, an outline, basically, a, a standard, something that has been set up already. The Apostle Paul is basically saying, look, I have given you, I'm, he's going to say this in a moment because he, he heard it from him, I've given you a model of biblical doctrine. I have given you a model of theology. I have incorporated to you the word of God. All right. This is something that you have here. And what I've given to you is the form. Hold fast the form. Go back to the prototype. Go back to the original. Go back to the origin. Go back to the standard. The biblical standard of what? Hold fast the form of sound words. Sound words? What does that mean? Well, the, the idea of sound words means Literally healthy words. These are words that are sound in the sense that they are free from decay, free from doctrine, free from, uh, not, not, not free from doctrine, sorry, that's several, free from error, free from being watered down doctrine. It means it's healthy, it's good, it's right, because we all understand that words have meanings. Despite what our culture tries to tell us, despite how they try to put different shades, despite you say, oh, this person's got a spin on that word, and that person's got a spin on this word, words have meanings. So when he talks about here that you are to hold on to sound words, sound means those healthy words, then those words refer to two areas. It means, number one, to the very word of God. We have no business changing the word of God. We have no business watering down the word of God. We have no business making the word of God more acceptable to the public. We have no, we have no business taking out the pronouns in the word of God to make it more gender acceptable. We have, we, we, have, we have no business doing that. Matter of fact, God gave a curse on people in the book of Revelation. It says that if you add anything to the word of God or you take away the things from the word of God, those plagues you see in the book of Revelation are going to come upon you and they'll be with you. So we don't want to play around with the word of God. We want to hold on to this book. This book gives us life right? This book has sound, healthy words. They may not be fun words. <laughs> they may not be words we want to hear all the time. It may feel like the Bible slapping us in the face and stepping on our toes and wrenching our hearts, but those are still good, sound words that we need. And he says, hold on to those things. Don't let that slip. Don't be intimidated by the culture to change things. To make it more palatable. Not only the sound words mean the biblical words, but sound words can also have the idea of doctrinal words. The word doctrine means teaching. Looking at, a pa looking at the word of God and finding a, a passage you want to teach on or a context. What does the Bible say about homosexuality? What does the Bible say about marriage? What does the Bible say about child rearing? What does the Bible say about a man and a woman? What does the Bible say about uh, death penalties? What does the Bible say about government? What does the Bible say how I'm supposed to get to heaven? What does the Bible say? And you study the whole Bible out from Genesis through Revelation and you compile the word of God because it will never ever contradict itself and you compile a good systematic doctrinal theology. And that is something that we should not let go. We need to use good, solid Bible words when we communicate today. And we need to use good, precise, accurate theology. Very prominent preachers are very good at changing the slight of a word. You deal with a cult, they do the same thing. When you talk to a cult and you say, hey... Do you believe in the resurrected Jesus Christ? Yeah, I believe in the resurrected Jesus Christ. We're the same. But when you're talking to a Mormon, they think that it's the spiritual resurrection of Christ, not the actual bodily resurrection from Christ. So they'll take these good, solid Bible words and they'll change them. They'll put a different slide on them. And that's goes on all the time. We need to be careful of that. And that's what helps you not be ashamed. Because if I take the word of God and I say what God says, and I have the authority of God's word, then I shouldn't feel like I'm doing something wrong. How many of you feel like sometimes you've done something wrong when you talk to someone about being a sinner? I felt that way. You say, hey man, you're a sinner. And they make you, put it, they, they make you feel like a piece of garbage. 
You tell them that Jesus Christ is the only way, and they give you all this rip roar and other kind of things, and it makes you feel like, man, I'm, I'm the wrong one. And then pretty soon you say, you know what I got to do? I got to change my wording a little bit. I, I got to make it sound a little bit more palatable for them. Because that way, I won't feel their ire. They won't be so mad at me for using those words. You see what I'm saying? So it's a slippery slope. And Timothy was in danger of possibly saying, I'm going to let some of these doctrinal things slide a little bit to be a little bit more palatable. I'm going to let the Word of God be toned down a little bit to be a little bit more palatable. But the problem is, every time you change a word, it could ever so slightly take away from the meaning, or it can change the meaning completely. So you got to hold on to that stuff. Don't be afraid. Even in our culture, where they say that you're being toxic or toxic, or you're being intolerable, or you don't know what it is, don't I know you're going to be tempted. Don't do it. Hold on to those good words. I already talked about one of them. Let's do some illustrations to help out. The word Christian means anything pertaining to the name of Jesus Christ. And like I talked about before, Christian used to mean that you were living like Christ. Look at the people that are out there that claim to be Christians. Are they any living anywhere near like the Lord Jesus Christ is? Would the Lord Jesus Christ approve of those abortion clinics? Would the Lord Jesus Christ approve of all these filthy things that are out there that these Christians are getting involved with, and yet they still maintain that they are Christians? And now, like I talked about before, because it's so prominent in the news, you have red Christians or conservative Christians, and now you got the blue liberal Christians, and how I can still be a Christian even though that I'm very liberal in my teaching, but that's, that's the Christianity that's going forward. Look, you're not a Christian. Jesus was not a liberal. Jesus taught the truth of the Word of God, and he didn't mince his words. Matter of fact, when Nicodemus went to talk to him, he looked at him right in the eye and said, guess what, bud? You got to be born again. Drop all your religiousness. Drop all that garbage around there. But you must be born again. You have to have a second birth. Right? Jesus was right in his face about it. No, I'm not saying Jesus was... Remember, I read some of these things with a marine background. So, he may not... I'm sure he was kind when he did it. All right? In my mind, I've always pictured... You know, that, that's why I always go like to Matthew, you know, uh, was it 22 and 24? You vipers! You know, I love that part where Jesus is <laughs> chewing them out. You yeah, whited wall sepulchers, you know. I'm like, I got to read that again. And my favorite lines is always from like John the Baptist. You know, John the Baptist, when he sees the Pharisees coming, hey, who has warned you to flee from the wrath to come? I'm like, man, I want to see that. I want to be part of that kind of thing. But I'm sure Jesus is more gentle. We're going to see that in a moment. But my mind, but you're not a Christian unless you have been born again. You have repented of your sins. Not just confess them, repented. You've changed your mind about your sin. Your sin is what, is, is what made you held accountable to God and you're on your way to hell unless you change your mind about your sin. It's not fun. It's not cool. It's not something that, that God is just going to excuse. It's not something you're going to say, oh God, please forgive me. You have to repent of those sins and put your total trust and faith in Jesus Christ and be born again. That's what you need to do. We see the word baptism. I hate that word. Why do I hate the word baptism? Well, because you know that I love the King James Version. But one of the things King James translators did was they took the word baptism and they left it in the Bible without translating what it means. Why? Because King James was a Catholic and they didn't want to put what it meant in there. So they didn't want to compromise the Word of God. So what they did was they did what's called transliteration. They took the Greek word baptizo, and they changed it to the English baptism. They, you know, the B and the A, and it, it went through. And they said, okay, we didn't, we didn't compromise it, but we did not tell you what it really meant. And because of that, we have nothing but problems today about baptism in all different religions. What does the word baptism literally mean? The word baptism literally means immersion. It means to be completely soaked and put under. That's what baptism means. So why didn't he say that? After Jesus was immersed. John, the immerser. Well, that would mean that my little sprinkling as a Catholic didn't count. That would mean the pouring of water on top of my head doesn't count. That would mean that if I get sprinkled, splashed, or whatever it is, that doesn't count because I have not been immersed. But because they chose to transliterate it rather than actually translate a good, solid Bible word about immersion, now people say there's all kinds of forms of baptism we could have, right? They change it all up. All because they did not take the word for what it was to mean immersion, to be completely surrounded and engulfed by water. Another thing that goes on, 
Bible translates church. Great word. I love church. We belong to a church. But does not church promote different thoughts to different people? Sure does. People believe in a universal church. People believe in an invisible church. People believe in this type of church, that type of church. When the word church literally means a local called out assembly of members that meet together. That's what it means. So how could they have translated it differently? Well, they could have called it an assembly. Or they could have called it a congregation. It's never invisible in the Bible. The church is always physically seen in a local place. Always. But because there's this idea of church, we can kind of, from the Augustine is where it originated from, the Catholic monk Augustine, the idea that now there's this universal church. And you can be part of this universal church once you trust Christ as your Savior. And that, you, you don't need a local church. Has that caused problems in our, in our culture today? 100%. Some of these false doctrines have seeped into good, solid Bible-preaching churches. And they've given themselves over to it because it sounds good and it's what's broadcasted because they refused or they unknowingly, I'll give them the benefit of the doubt, they unknowingly let something slip rather than choosing good, solid Bible words. What about the word hell? How often do you hear a fiery hell be preached today? I always hear it as now just being the separation from God. If you die today, you will be separated from God. What does that mean to people? Okay, so what? I'm separated from God. What does that mean? Well, you've got to realize that separation from hell, death does mean separation. I'll give you that. But that's a little bit too limited. You are going to go to an eternal lake of fire called hell for judgment. Don't water it down. Don't make it more palatable for people. God wants you to know that hell is hell. That hell is an eternal torment where the wicked do not rest, and they are tormented day and night, forever and ever and ever. It's not just a separation from God. It's not feeling lonely. It's not being in a dark place. It's not hiding out with your friends. It's none of that garbage. It is a literal lake of fire. What about sin? Oh, can't use that word nowadays, right? Sin can't be sin. Let's call it a mistake. Let's call it a disease. How about you're a sinner and you're an outright rebel against God. We can't say that to people nowadays, Pastor. Are you letting it slip? See, because now you just say something to them, oh, hey, you know, you've just made mistakes in your life. We're okay. Come on now. Sin is more than a mistake. Sin is a willful choice against a thrice holy God. Amen. That's what sin is. Amen. And they've transgressed. And they've committed iniquity. And they need to hear that. But Pastor, if you tell people that, they're not going to listen to you. Look, we're going to get to how you approach them in a moment. But I'm just telling you, don't leave good, sound, healthy Bible words. Can't even call someone a sinner nowadays. What are they? Well, I'm the unchurched. Oh, so you're one of the unchurched, right? Come on now. You're a sinner. You have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You know, it's not fun to tell people that, but it's needful. I could go on and on. My time could be spent on all the politically correct words and how people have watered down all the garbage that's out there, how people have trying to change the word of God, the non-binary, binary, whatever you call it, gender specific, unspecific, take out the word he for God because that's too male chauvinistic, blah, 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 all the garbage that they're doing nowadays. Please stay away from it. Don't be ashamed to use good, solid Bible words. Don't be ashamed of a good, solid Bible and what that has, because these are the healthy words. These are the words that we need to communicate to people. He says, hold fast the form of sound words. Hold fast those original, hold fast those prototypes, hold fast those words that the Apostle Paul used when he communicated the Word of God to us. Hold fast the form of sound words which thou hast heard of me. We know that it was the Apostle Paul, the witch there, the witch refers to the sound words. He says, these words you have heard from me. Now, heard means you've actually listened to me say these things. And when it says here, of me, it's literally a prepositional phrase in the Greek that is the of meaning out of. It's easier for us to understand in our English, we have the King James text, to put the word from there. Because that's, that's the word of. It means coming out of. And that's where they get the words of me, meaning the words came out of me. right? But we don't talk that way a little bit today. So the idea actually means from me. It just means the Apostle Paul is the one that communicated these biblical words and these biblical truths is what he's trying to say here. Hold fast the form of sound words which thou hast heard of me. 
right? And did the Apostle Paul get in trouble for preaching the way he preached? Oh, you better believe it. The Apostle Paul, got, that's why he's in jail. That's why the situation that he's in right now, because his preaching was very unpopular, but I'll tell you what it was. It was very accurate to the Word of God. It was very true to the Word of God. It's what sent him into prison. Remember when he, he, when he was out there preaching about the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. He stood before Festus and he said, I'm called into account before you today because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And what did Festus say? Hey, Paul, you're mad. You're insane. You know, but I want to hear a little bit more about this thing, but go back to prison for a while. You know, but that bodily resurrection, you've got to be not, too many books, too much learning has caused you to go mad, Paul. You're nuts. There's no such thing as that bodily resurrection. And you end up going into prison. And then he had to stand before Augustus and the Apostle Paul. Did not waver. You would think, hey, I got in trouble for saying the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to water that down a little bit so Augustus, who's a little higher than Fe uh, Festus, won't be so bad at me. So maybe I'll water down the story a little bit. What was his model? What was his example? You need to be born again, man. <laughs> Jesus Christ died for you, was buried and rose again. You got to trust it. He bodily rose from the dead. And Augustus said, man, I want to let you go, but you, like a knucklehead, appealed to Caesar. So now I got to keep you in prison until Caesar comes. And that extended his in-home prison for another two or three years. But the Apostle Paul said, I'm not compromising. I'm not dropping the ball. I'm going to hold fast. So Timothy, in your culture... In that religious culture, in that unacceptably social culture, in that political culture, I want you to hold fast to those words. I want you to hold fast to those solid, good Bible words. Don't be intimidated by the culture. You know, these words that we're going to be using is going to be offensive. Don't get me wrong. You use good Bible words, good, precise, accurate theology. It is going to be offensive to a number of people, especially, uh, what do they call them nowadays? Snowflakes or something like that. If I insulted you, I apologize. I'm not trying. It's, it's whatever it is. There's people that can't handle plain truth anymore to your face. Right? So how are we supposed to do it? The Marine way? <laughs> the guy promised me that he wouldn't go to church. What me and my buddies do? We'd go in his room. At, well, church was at 8 o'clock. We'd go in at 7.30, sneak in, break into his back window, and then we'd tie him up, drag him by a headlock. And then, you said you were coming to church with us, you know, and the Marines kicking and screaming and stuff. But we brought him to church, right? Is that how we're supposed to do it? Pretty soon no one said they wanted to go to church anymore. They, they knew if you said it, you had a little group there that was going to make sure you went to church, whether you liked it or not. Now, again, I had a lot of zeal, not a lot of knowledge. What is he supposed to do? Are we supposed to be offensive? No, he gives us the pattern. He gives us the way we're supposed to do it. Hold fast the form of sound words which thou hast heard of me. How? In faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. Faith is our direction towards God. When you come to these solid good words of the Word of God, you need to know that you need to be fully persuaded that the, that the Word, you need to be fully persuaded and fully committed to the words that you are speaking, to the Word of God. You need to be confirmed that, yes, I believe this. This, this is what the Bible says, and I believe it. Otherwise, you're going to be a wish-washy mess. Problem with soulless Christianity is they don't have any biblical convictions. You need to know what the Bible says, believe what the Bible says, and believe what the Bible says. Not just sit there and say, I got it in my head, because when you get painted in a corner, guess what you're going to do? <laughs> All right, you're right. No, no, no. Sorry. Yeah, I, I probably shouldn't have said you that. Yeah. No! You're going to take your stand and say, whatever, that's what the Bible says. Fight with God, not me. These are good, solid words. You need by faith, trust that this is the word of God. And you know what happens? What a person truly, what a person truly, <laughs> what a person truly believes, betrays. I kept mixing those two, <laughs> believes and betrays together. What a person truly believes is betrayed by how they live. You didn't say portrayed. No, I said betrayed. Why did I say betrayed? Because a lot of people say they believe one thing and their lives are living something completely different. Your habits in life tell you what you truly believe inside. Because if you truly believe what you believe, it changes your life. So you got to make sure you hold on to these words in faith towards God. This is God's word, and I believe it. And this should affect my life and change my life for all eternity. This should actually affect the way I live. Not just the things I say. Not just someone look at my life and they say, oh, uh, you know what I'm saying? i got to go by faith. i got to take the word of God 
and apply it to my life by faith, that these are actually God's words and they mean something. So our communicate to God is having these, whole, these words by faith. Our communicate to the people, of course, is having these words in love. We already learned from 1 Corinthians chapter number 13 that you could have the most eloquent speech in the world, but if you have not love, guess what you are? Tinkling brass, like a cymbal. Sounds like someone just clattering, clang, 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 clang. You can go to work, and if they know that you don't love them and you don't care for them, you're not going to show the love of Christ towards them, you know what they hear? They hear the Charlie Brown phone. Had that ever watched Charlie Brown? He had no idea what the other person, the adult, was saying. Charles Schultz did that for a reason because he wanted to show that kids really don't understand what adults are saying. And so he conveyed that by whenever an adult would talk to a kid in the Charlie Brown cartoons, it would always be a yes, Mrs. Jones. Like, I don't know what he's talking about. Anyway, I was going to say, yeah. That's how people take you if they know that you don't care for them, right? So we got to approach people. With love. Our method and mannerisms have to be motivated by the love that comes from the Lord Jesus Christ. Our communication with fellow man have to be words spoken with truth, but the truth needs to be spoken in love. We need to convey these words always to be with grace and seasoned with salt. Don't let them get underneath your skin. Don't go down to their level, but don't compromise. You can still be loving without compromising. You can still believe that that individual is a sinner and that individual has sin and you can convey that to them with love and let the Holy Spirit do the rest. This love and this faith that we have, it says here, hold fast the form of sound words which thou hast heard of me in faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. That means the Lord Jesus Christ has originated that. It's from the faith and love that come from the Lord Jesus Christ at the time of our salvation. Once we have that trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, we have that relationship with God, we have that relationship with the Word of God through faith, and then we can also now love one another. We can love our enemies. We can reach out to people in love because the Holy Spirit is living with inside of us and also Jesus Christ originates that love through us so there's no excuse why you can't do it you can't sit back and say well I'm not that type of personality I'm just not confrontational if you've been saved you have that faith to do it and you have that love to do it you just need to do it no more excuses don't let the culture intimidate you. Don't let the political culture intimidate you. Don't let the religious culture intimidate you. Don't let the social culture intimidate you. But do it in love and by faith through the Lord Jesus Christ. He goes on to conclude this part. And he has an interesting thing. He says, that, uh, that good thing which was committed unto thee, keep by the Holy Ghost which dwelleth in us. Well, what is this? What is that good thing? What is that referring to? Well, let's break the rest of the verse down and see if we can understand what that good thing is because he kind of helps us understand it to a point. So let's forget about what that good thing is. We'll circle around and we'll come back to what that is at the end. But this good thing that we're trying to figure out what it is says here, which was committed unto thee. Committed unto. What does it mean to commit unto me? Well, it's the same exact word that we used in verse number 12, if you remember when I preached on that. And uh, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12, at the very end when he says, For I know whom I have believed, and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. That's the identical Greek word. It's the identical phrasing. So the idea was that the apostle Paul committed. Remember I said what commit was? It was a banking term. It means to deposit. It means to entrust. That the apostle Paul deposited his entire life, his entire being, to the Lord Jesus Christ to take care of him. That's when he was saved. I know who I've committed myself to. I've deposited all to him. That same word is used now when it's talking about that good thing that is given to us. There's a way that is us when we get saved, we deposit our lives into God, but now we're going to see God has deposited, has entrusted us with that good thing. So this is a special divine entrustment that is given to every single believer, not just Timothy. He says, that good thing which was committed, divinely entrusted unto thee, unto you, keep the word keep is the eighth imperative given in this chapter so far. And that word keep means, of course, to protect, to guard, to stay vigilant over. 
So there is something that has been entrusted to you and I that our responsibility is to watch over it, to be vigilant over, to keep it, to guard it, to protect it. What other information do we get? He says, That good thing which was committed unto thee, keep. How? By the Holy Ghost which dwelleth in us. Well, my time's slowing down, so I'm not going to talk about the Holy Spirit living inside us. We already know that. When you come to know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, immediately upon salvation, the Holy Spirit of God comes and resides inside of you. He gives you those gifts of the Holy Spirit. He, he, he becomes your comforter, your teacher, your helper, your enabler, all those great things that the Holy Spirit does. He is your earnest. He is your down payment of, of getting into heaven. You know that once you are saved, the earnest, the guarantee of you getting into heaven is nothing you have done but the Holy Spirit of God residing inside of you. He's the one that keeps you. He's the one that saves you. He's the one that regenerates you. He's the one that washes you. He has an amazing ministry, the Holy Spirit of God, though he takes a back seat to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why we don't honor the Holy Spirit and praise him and everything else. Matter of fact, the Bible says don't do that. He says, all oh, glory, the Holy Spirit's going to point to Jesus Christ, and that's what he does. He wants to take that back seat. How many of you like serving in the back and not the front? Don't you hate when people call you to the front and embarrass you? I mean, it's nice to get acknowledged every once in a while. But if you're one of those people that like doing things behind the scenes, don't you hate it when the pastor calls you up, makes you stand, makes everybody clap, and you, you don't want to do that, right? Because you're, you're a behind-the-scenes type guy? Well, that's what the Holy Spirit is. He's a behind-the-scenes type guy. He does a lot. You know, just like a lot of behind-the-scenes people do. They're the ones that are usually washing the toilets and cleaning the bathrooms, making sure things are stocked. Aren't you thankful that when you go to our bathrooms that there's toilet paper in it? You know, I've been to a church where they haven't had that, or it hasn't been cleaned in weeks. Or you go downstairs, it's all musty. And Aren't you thankful to go to a church? Where you, you know you can walk into this building, it's going to be clean. Aren't you thankful? Especially if you've never done it before. What do you think just happens overnight? You snap of fingers and things get cleaned up? No, there's people working behind the scenes. And they don't want any of the glory. They, don't want any, they, they just want to get things done for the Lord and be thankful that their job's done for the Lord. Well, that's what the Holy Spirit's like. Does all this work, amazing things behind the scenes. But he doesn't want to be brought to the forefront, right? So the Holy Spirit resides inside of us. And through his enabling, through our submission to him, you and I now have the ability, because we could not do it on our own. God is not going to entrust us with something. You know why? We'll drop it. We'll lose it. We'll fail it. So when God gives us the command, I want you to keep this, I want you to keep this good thing which I've deposited into you, which I've entrusted to you, I know you're weak and I know you can't do it, so you're going to need to rely on the Holy Spirit of God. That's what he says. He says this. He says, That good thing which, has, which was committed unto thee, keep by, by means of the Holy Ghost. It's the Holy Spirit of God that you're going to have the ability to keep this entrusted thing to you, which dwelleth in us. So what is this entrusted thing that has been given to us? What has been divinely deposited into our lives? Well, there's a fight over it in most commentaries. Most people believe it's the gospel, preaching an accurate gospel, because they say you got Christ, faith, love, all aspects of the gospel brought up there, and that when we get saved, we are ambassadors for Christ. We are called as an ambassador, and it is our job to go out into this world and preach an accurate gospel, not a watered-down gospel, not a palatable gospel, but the true gospel of Jesus Christ it has been entrusted to us to do. And by the Holy Spirit of God, we can protect that and we can go out there and we can do that. And I agree with that. But I think that's limited. I believe not only is it the gospel, but I also believe it's the Word of God. The accurate teaching and doctrines of the Word of God, which encapsulates the gospel. Look, if you and I, got, what I believe it's saying in these two verses is that God has entrusted to us His Word, the doctrines, the truth, the healthy words. He's He's divinely given in you that job. And he's given you the Holy Spirit whereby you can keep it and you can hold those sound words and you can stand up in a culture that is decaying and falling apart and canceling and all that other filth that's out there making things politically correct, but he gives you the ability, the strength, and the power to stay strong with the word of God, come what may. That's that good thing that's been given to you. You, me, all of us, each individual, I don't know how to say it to make it so it's like in your face without being in your face. You, if I could point to everybody, <laughs> picture me in your face. You, you know, one of those kind of things. You have been given this to hold fast and to guard. What if you don't? What, 
Let's say you decide to coddle to the culture. And you decide to change the words. And you decide to be more palatable. Where's the truth going to come from? You gave it up so easily. You're going to coddle to the culture? Where's it going to come from next? And by the way, that's just going to enter into a slippery slope. What if you, all of us, fingers pointing to me too, but I don't want to say us because then it sounds like, oh, we'll just say pastor. You, as an individual who has been saved, what if you who has been entrusted with holding fast the word of God refuse to study and you don't have an accurate theology and you don't know what the Bible words really are and then you start changing them without even knowing it. You start falling into it because you haven't studied enough. You haven't challenged yourself enough in the word of God. So you start changing. What if you do that? What's going to happen to the culture? What's going to happen to the truth? What if you neglect what God has entrusted, divinely deposited into your account, entrusted you to keep, to guard, and to proclaim, what if you don't? What's going to happen? That's the gist that Paul's telling Timothy. That will stop you from being ashamed because you're going to know this is what the Word of God says. I don't care what the culture says. This is what God says. His words are truth. His words are health. He's got the right Bible words. I don't have to coddle. I got to do it lovingly, but I don't have to coddle. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this encouragement again, Lord. It is so timely because, Father, it is so hard sometimes because we have to confront people we love, confront people in the community, confront things that you place in our way, that sphere of influence that you so graciously given us the privilege of our outreach and the people that we influence. Father, too often we are fading away. We are fearful. We are not holding fast to these good, solid Bible words and Bible teaching. We do try to coddle down, Lord. We've, we've failed in many areas of our lives. But Lord, I'm so thankful that you've given us the Holy Spirit and that Holy Spirit dwells in us. And even though we may have failed previously, he hasn't left. He's there forever. And He can strengthen us. He can enable us. He can motivate us to keep. He can give us the words to say. He's the great teacher. He's the great comforter. He's the great enabler. Lord, He's all those things, and you've given them to us. So, Lord, help us to stop relying on ourselves and be worried about what this culture thinks of us. But help us to rely on you and be more concerned what you think of us. Father, bless your people here today as only you can, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand, please, with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. With our heads bowed and eyes closed, this is our time of invitation. This is a time when you get alone with the Lord, and you may have made a decision for Him already, but if you haven't, this is just the time to, to think about it. we got a good old-fashioned altar up here if you want to take care of it there. You can take care of it there in your seats. The most important thing is do business with the Lord. Let me ask you a couple questions. First and foremost, are you 100% sure that if you died today, you'd go to heaven? Have you realized that you are that sinner, that you, you have offended God? And there's nothing you can do to get rid of that sin but to put your total trust and faith in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. Have you done that? If you've never done that, we invite you to raise your hand. If you're a man, I'll get a man. If you're a lady, I'll get a lady to take the word of God and show you from the Bible how you have your sins forgiven in a home in heaven. Is there anyone like that at all? Christian, think back over the last two years. Have you compromised? Have you dropped the ball? Have you allowed the culture and the political correctness seep into your terminology and theology? Have you gotten lazy in your study and therefore probably don't even know if those are the wrong words to use so you think they're just fine? Have you gotten lazy in your service? Have you coddled when you should be standing? Has the Lord laid someone on your heart that he wants you to reach out to but you're afraid to lose their friendship 
You're afraid to lose their quote-unquote respect if you did that? How are the Lord's dealing with your heart? Don't neglect that gift that's been divinely entrusted to you. What a precious thing it is. We cannot be lazy with it and we cannot neglect it. Please do visit the Lord before you leave this place. Amen. I do appreciate all of you being here. Remember the invitation didn't stop there. Let's get out there and let's serve the Lord together. I ask Brother Mark if you can close us in a word of prayer, please, sir. Father, once again, we thank you for allowing us to uh, gather together as Christians. And Father, we are so thankful to have a pastor that uh, takes the time to study and, and gives us what you laid upon his heart and your words. And Father, just uh, let us take it to heart. Let us put it into action. Father, help us to be bold as you present opportunities as we go through this week to uh, share the gospel and to make our stand. And the Father, again, remember to do it in, in, in love, but uh, boldness. Father, we just thank you for this day. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The Lord bless you. Have a great day. We'll see you on Wednesday, if not sooner. Thank you all for being here today.